Hello everyone. I read to Yon Guide has been requested a lot of times in the past and even more so since all the changes to East Asia and mandate mechanics in the 1.29 patch. And so I finally decided to make this IRAT guide. However, when I was making this guide, I realized that the new changes to the events with Ming and the mandate mechanics in general makes playing IRAT really, really easy. The main challenge when playing IRAT in previous patch was dealing with Ming, as Ming starts fairly strong and they did not explode that often. That has obviously changed now and honestly, playing IRAT is basically playing a horde. So in this guide, we will go over the starting strategy of playing as Oirat, dealing with Ming and farming Yuan, basically the first 50 years or so. Oirat in the current patch starts with 117 development and 28 provinces, which is fairly strong. Economy looks decent, but that won't look as good once we get our cavalry regiments going. We have a vassal in Mongolia, and they start as disloyal, so we will start improving relations with them. We will also set Chagatai and Uzbek as rivals and embargo them. There is a small chance that if your first war with Ming doesn't go very well, Uzbek or Chagatai might attack you. If you're worried about that, you can ally Korchin. That will give you a bit of defensive cover. Just don't join any defensive wars for them. It's not worth it. Also don't royal marry them. It's going to be a very temporary alliance. For decisions, take the vision quest decision as more prestige is important. Then you have to choose between yellow or black shamanism, that's between extra missionary strength or extra tolerance of heathens, and it really depends on how you want to play the game long term. If you're going to take religious ideas later, take the missionary strength, and if you're going for a more humanist game, take the tolerance. Going humanist and taking tolerance is going to make the game slightly easier though. We do start as Tengri with fairly low religious unity, and we have the option to take syncretic faiths, but don't take any syncretic fates yet. The 50 prestige hit is a lot and we need prestige for our early wars. Start building spy network on Ming as we are going to declare on them fairly soon. Then raise hosts from the tribe estate and decrease army maintenance to zero. We are a tribe and so we start without feudalism embraced, which means 50% extra tech cost. That won't be an issue for long, but it does mean that we need to attack Ming soon as they will likely get military tech 4 before us. You should also stab up as soon as possible. This will unlock two more decisions which give national unrest reduction, stab cost reduction and yearly prestige. All permanent modifiers and they are very helpful. Next step is attacking Ming. You can wait till your manpower is recovered a bit, but I wouldn't wait too long as we don't want Ming to get military tech 4. I'd say attack Ming when your manpower is about 19k-ish. Your vassal Mongolia might still be disloyal when you attack, and that's fine. Ming armies will go to Mongolia first to siege it down, and they will become loyal very soon. So, it's time to raise army maintenance and declare on Ming using the Mandate of Heaven CB. You can call in Korchen if possible, they will also act as a good distraction. Now in this first war, Ming has a bigger army than us and we cannot really go head to head against them. So there is a new event to help us. This event will fire if we defeat a Ming army being led by their emperor. Ming actually gets an event making their emperor a general and AI will always put him charge of an army. The strategy is to locate this particular army. Be patient and don't rush into it. Try to fight the army when it's isolated. It's actually really easy to defeat. And when you do that, you get an event, the capture of the Ming Emperor, giving you 20% morale and 25% siege ability till the death of our king or till Ming appoints a new emperor. That morale and siege boost is massive and enough to win this war on its own actually. But the event chain isn't done yet. Next step is to siege down Beijing, beeline straight for it and siege it down. And once you have sieged down Beijing, another event fires, the capture of Beijing. This event gives you control of every province in the North China region. Yes, that includes all the forts as well. This will also tank the mandate down to zero, and we know what that means. Easy war from this point on, and a huge war score as we control all of North China. And now it's time to just run around and kill Ming armies over and over again, till we can take 100% war score. From this war, I took Beijing of course, and as many forts as possible, along with all their money. As being a horde, we always need money. 
we do gain a lot of inflation for it and you will have to buy down inflation from time to time. Keep an eye on it. Also look for an inflation reduction advisor. It's also a good time to start annexing Mongolia. We need those provinces to complete a mission. So it's 1452 and Ming has their mandate as zero. It's time to kick back and chill till we recover some manpower and till the course are done. Also now we can embrace feudalism because we got it from the Ming provinces. You should also pick up Confucian as a syncretic faith now as that would help with the rebels a bit and the stab cost modifier is going to be very helpful. And the reason stab cost modifier is going to be helpful is because we are going to truce break Ming, most likely more than once. The aim here is to ensure Ming is completely removed from the game before one of the breakaway Chinese nations take the mandate. So as soon as the course were done, I attacked Ming again. Since they have their own culture group and only Korea shares their religion, really no one cares too much about truce breaking Ming. Always declare using the mandate CB and this war won't be hard obviously. In my game Ming had 5k troops at this point, plus separatist rebels in the south. I started sieging down their capital and all the eastern provinces. About this time the unguarded frontier disaster also fired. The disaster progresses up by 1.5% if Ming is fighting a neighboring horde and have minus 10% war score and by 3% if they have minus 25% war score or more. Once again from this war we will take all their money and as many provinces as possible. Then raise and core the provinces. I tend to always raise the provinces and thus you can go a little bit over 100% over extension. It's 1457, we already had two wars with Ming and the mandate is zero and the Ming plosion has begun. Now as soon as the provinces are cored, it's time for another truce break in 1459. Yes, the A is there, but really who cares? We will again take all the money and all the provinces we can, including Nanjing. So this is Ming in 1464. Soon, the losing control of South event fired where two marches are released from Ming. Both are disloyal though, so they won't really help with any wars against Ming. Now at this point you could truce break again once courts are done, however since now there are more Chinese nations there is a high likelihood they will form a coalition against you. Which isn't a really big deal but if you don't want a coalition to form you can just wait for a bit. In my playthrough I decided to play a little less aggressive game. I realized that not everyone plays as aggressively as me and especially it's harder for newer players. So I decided to pace myself a bit. The strategy here is to wait till there are more breakaway Chinese nations so we can take Ming on more easily. You can now also cancel your alliance with Korchin as you will attack them soon. I decided to wait this time till Ming truce was over. You could go around and fight other nations in the meantime and that's what I would have done in a normal playthrough but like I said I wanted to play a bit slower. So it was a few years of no warfare. Playing as Horde it's not an ideal way to play as it tanks the Horde unity if you're not looting or raising provinces. We can fix that part though by completing the first mission now which gives plus 25 Horde unity. Keep this Horde unity missions for when you need the extra Horde unity. Eventually integration of Mongolia will be completed, that completes another mission and you can get 20 more Horde unity from it. So we will save that mission for later as well. This mission also gives plus one Horde unity from a new modifier in a province. This is a permanent modifier as long as you hold that province. Finally in 1476 the Ming truce ended and it was time to declare on them once more. Now there were a lot of Chinese breakaway nations and Ming was relatively small. Of course they were still suffering from the low mandate malices. In my game Ming had a couple of ex-slave provinces which I could not take in this war so I released those provinces as nations and then took 100% war score worth of provinces ensuring that no one else was bordering Ming now. This meant I could finish off Ming later and I don't have to worry about anyone else taking the mandate. After that it was time to declare on Korchin. We need all of Korchin and a couple of provinces from Haishi to form Yuan. So I full annex Korchin which completes another mission giving more perma claims. This mission also fires an event, reuniting the Mongols. We get a choice to make Mongol as our primary culture and all provinces with Korchin, Kalka and Oirat culture become Mongol culture instead. A fairly significant change. There is a second option where Mongol and Korchin become accepted culture and we get plus 3 max promoted cultures. Mongol and Korchin cultures are already part of our culture group and they will become accepted once we become an empire so that part seems moot. The plus 3 promoted culture is fairly strong. However, I decided to go with the first option. Not only do we get a lot of provinces with our primary culture, but also if later in game you form the Mongol Empire tag, you can get banners from provinces of Mongol culture. So more Mongol culture provinces means more banners. 
Now it was time to attack Haishi and I took a few provinces from them. Checking our requirements to form Yuan, we need few more provinces from Karadel and Chagatai, so I decided to get started on that as well. Chagatai had a couple of allies, but AI is just not good at handling horde mechanics and they are very easy to roll over. I took the provinces I needed from Chagatai and later Karadel as well. Now all we need to form Yuan is plus 2 stab and we need to be the Emperor of China, which isn't actually true and we'll come back to it. We still have truce with Ming, so I decided to attack Korea instead. I wanted to make them a tributary. I have already made other church and tribes my tributaries. Korea was allied with Ashikaga, but obviously with my strong cavalry, they were no match. And in less than four years, I had made Korea my tributary. Finally, in 1494, it was time to end Ming. Easy and quick 100% war. Newer players who haven't played in the China region might not know this, but if you full annex the Emperor of China, the Emperor mechanic in game goes away. The mandate mechanic is gone forever. So here is the choice for you. Either you take the mandate for yourself, or you can get rid of the mandate mechanic. The reason I don't think taking mandate here is a good idea is because starting as Oirat and forming Yuan doesn't give you anything when taking mandate. All it does is that you lose the Horde government as you will become the Celestial Empire and then you will have to tackle the mandate and meritocracy mechanics. You do get the Celestial reforms, but I don't think they are worth all the trouble that will come with trying to keep mandate and meritocracy high. As opposed to a Manchu Ching guide where I think taking mandate early is important as you are Manchu culture and can become an empire accepting all Chinese cultures and you get a great mission tree with Ching giving mandate growth modifiers, meritocracy modifiers and just straight up 20 mandate more than once. Taking mandate as Ching makes sense. While as Oirat or Yuan, you don't get any modifiers on mandate or meritocracy in the mission tree. You don't get any culture bonuses and you lose the horde government. So taking mandate starting as Oirat is not a great idea. Now we saw earlier that in order to form Yuan, you need to be Emperor of China. However, if there is no Emperor of China mechanic in game, the requirement changes to being just an empire, which is great. Once we full annex the current Emperor Ming, we get an event giving us free monarch points and prestige and now all we have to do is get to 1000 development to become an empire. And that's not really hard given how many perma claims we have and that we are a horde. And that's basically the gist of playing Oirat. Rush Ming, truce break couple of times, make sure no one else gets the mandate, then full annex Ming and just play as horde and keep making tributaries everywhere you can. In my game, next I attacked Chagatai and took 100% war score provinces from them. Then I attacked Tibet as we can complete a mission from there as well, which fires an event, the Khan and the Dalai Lama. This one gives an option to change the state religion to Vajrayana. It does give 3% missionary strength and 50% missionary cost for 50 years, but Vajrayana religion isn't particularly strong in game and it's really up to you how you want to play. I decided to take the second option here giving unrest and autonomy modifier in Tibet provinces for 20 years. After that, I took 100% war score provinces from Yu and then went back to Chagatai again. Then it was time to take on Uzbek as they also have a lot of our culture group provinces. And that brought me to 1000 plus development. And now we can upgrade the government rank to Empire. And finally form Yuan. With Yuan, we get more Parma claims on China and Manchuria region. And we get a fantastic set of ideas. It's one of the best in games. At this time, if Timurids are as big as they are in my game, it's time to start looking for a couple of good alliances to protect against potential coalitions. The next big target is to form the Mongol Empire obviously, which will come a bit later as you need a lot of provinces for it. In the meantime, you can keep following the awesome mission tree, it's actually really good. You get a lot of perma claims and some permanent modifiers. Here, if you take Kyoto, you get plus one yearly prestige permanently, and of course, perma claims on Japan. If you take parts of Russia and Lithuania, you get minus 15% province war cost permanently. That is huge. And for the last mission, basically you need to take all of provinces needed to form the Mongol Empire, which gives you permanent minus three national unrest and minus 15% stab cost modifier. This mission tree is OP and actually gives a very good incentive to keep playing till late game. There are a few other missions here that I will let you guys explore on your own.
Before we end this guide, I wanted to also briefly discuss ideas. Starting as Horde, I almost always take aristocratic ideas, as you will run cavalry heavy army all game, and getting that extra cav compatibility is very helpful. The second idea I would recommend is Humanist, as you will be taking over a lot of different religion provinces, and unless you're going for one faith, taking Humanist early is important. After that, you can take Diplor, Influence, Economic, and then Quality. And that's the end of this guide. In my game it's 1517 and we have formed Yon. As I mentioned, I tried to play this one rather slow to make sure newer players can follow along. Being a horde, it's hard to keep the economy functioning sometimes, but despite playing not very aggressive, we don't have any loans, we have a positive income and a good bank, we don't have high inflation, we are fairly caught up on tech, we have developed colonialism institution, which we can soon embrace, we have finished the aristocratic idea group and we have some great bonuses from Yuan ideas with 30% CAV compatibility and some seriously powerful generals. And we have a fair number of tributaries too. So all in all, we are doing pretty well. From here on, you can easily complete the backend control achievement as well where you need to be the only nation holding provinces in China. I hope this guide helps newer players get a hang of playing Oirat. It's mostly just playing as a horde, except for the truce breaking Ming part and making sure no one else takes the mandate. If you have another creative strategy for Oirat or have an experience to share with the new patch, let us know in comments down below. You were watching a Radiator's Guide. Thank you for your time, and I'll see you all in the next one.